Hi, Alana. This is so exciting. This is our very first episode of Fizz and Tell, and it seems so appropriate that you're my first guest because it's all your fault. We're here. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that. I'll take the blame for that. <laughs> blame. Take the blame. Um, you know, your encouragement and support for me to do this. I, I want to say thank you publicly for that. And um you know. Any conversations that are about women and for women to help women, I will champion. And I love that. And I love that. And I'd love you to introduce yourself and the wonderful work that you do to our audience. Thank you. And thanks for having me here. Honestly, I'm delighted. Um, so I'm Alana Kirk. Uh, I work as the midlife coach. Uh, I'm based in Dublin, but I, I work all over uh, like yourself. And I didn't, it's funny, my 18 year old daughter is just making her plans for college. And, you know, when I was leaving school, there wasn't a box that said midlife coach. And if there had been, I probably wouldn't have ticked it. But like many women in midlife, um, often you come to a place where your life experiences have led you to new experiences and new opportunities. So I spent uh, the good first part of my, my career uh, working in the nonprofit sector. And then through a certain series of events, um, my marriage ended and my mum died after a, a long illness of being cared for. Um, I kind of felt quite untethered. I was untethered from the family I'd been born into and untethered from the family I'd created. And um, I was really interested in working with women anyway. I was doing a lot of writing as a journalist, a freelance journalist at that point. So I went back to college in my 40s and retrained. And now I work with women in midlife and I help them navigate this incredibly unique extended midlife that we have today where for the first time in history women get to live real vibrant valiant lives beyond that sort of normal traditional role that was always given to women of a value whether or not you've had children or not there was certainly a sense that there was a period of time when women had a role and then that they didn't and now we're seeing such a, a redefinition of what is possible for women. Um, and I work in that area, helping women navigate, be that marriages, post-marriages, um, change of career, kids leaving home, or just overwhelm, which as I know, as a, as a single mother yourself, that is a real, a real thing. And I wrote a book last year called uh, Midlife Redefined, Better, Bolder, Brighter. And a lot of that was about just recognizing this wonderful space we're in, but also how hard it is and how to really for women to connect to themselves and put themselves first and learn to live their life driven from the inside out rather than always reacting to the external demands, which many of us find ourselves doing. And, and you're so right, because everything seems to be reactionary, I, you know, as a, as a parent, as someone who's working, as, as a woman who's juggling so many different things and so many different hats, we feel that we don't actually have time to sit down, take stock. And I know with the clients that I work with, I always say, right, just breathe. Let's just take five minutes to breathe and take stock of who you are, where you've come from and what you do. And the reason I'm, I'm bringing Fizz and Tell to to a wider audience is I want real women and real lives I'm kind of sick of celebrity endorsed products celebrity I feel I feel like my whole menopause era <laughs> that I'm in is endorsed by celebrities mm. I don't want that I don't want to be told what I should be doing what I should be wearing and what I should be saying to other people I, I I want to take that empowerment back and I'm hoping by bringing you on and other women people will get that um that's absolutely right and I mean I think first of all I think it is great to acknowledge the conversations that are happening over the last five years that just were not happening before and if that needs celebs to do that initially fantastic but I think we are opening up the platform now to everyday women being able to talk about menopause very openly in public and in mixed I'm actually at a creative retreat at the moment so it's full of uh, writers and artists and 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 uh, musicians and there's young and old and male and female and we all had a conversation last night about menopause I don't think that would have happened five years ago you know and a lot of women wouldn't have wanted to even mention it but um I also think it's a really exciting time for women in midlife even though it is hard and often the work that I do is helping women understand the context of their lives when life feels hard it's usually because it is hard now give yourself a break understand the context of your life right now and then 
you know, give yourself what you need first to be all of the roles. I liken it often to those, you know, those uh, nesting doll sets, you know, the doll within the doll within the doll within the doll. Thanks. And we start off with this beautiful core person. I have three daughters. They're all so different. So, you know, you start off with your core and then you will take on a, 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 a cover or a, a, a outer layer of the culture and the society and the family life. So I grew up in 1970s, 80s Belfast. So I'd have taken on the cultural narrative and one that women had a very clear place, by the way. And then you might take on another cover as in, in the area that you want to do and work in. And then you might take on a cover as a partner. Then you take one on as a mother until eventually this outer doll is the one you present to the world, your Facebook cover. And the key in life is for that core to influence and color all of those roles. But what can often happen is that those roles smother the core. So a lot of the work that I do is about having women to connect to yourself. You're not giving up all of these roles or doing anything, but you're understanding that you've got to live from the inside out. Um, you know, and I speak in my book about we spend the first part of our life asking the question, what about my life to look like? And we create that checklist. I want this, 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 this and this. And that will when I've checked all those boxes, career, partner, house, whatever, that's me successful. And often we can get to midlife going, well, that's all great, but I'm absolutely exhausted or it took for me more than it gave or whatever it might be. And then I say that's the time to ask the better question. Not what do I want my life to look like, but what do I want my life to feel like? Exactly. And it is about that emotional journey. And I think often we, you know, we get so consumed by having to do the right thing and be the right person for everybody else that we lose our identity. And I, I know I kind of started to find myself probably about five years ago, <laughs> just before at the end of my divorce, I started to actually think, who am I? What, what, what do I want? Actually, what do I want? Where do I want to live? What do I want to do? How do I want to do this? And how do I want to feel? And those are brilliant, brilliant questions that often women have never asked themselves. They, they, they and, and, and they don't, and they often don't get the opportunity to ask themselves questions. And I think menopause is not just what happens to us physically, but more importantly, I think it's what happens to us emotionally and and it can be a rebirthing or it can be a completely horrendous experience depending on where your mindset is and what your thought process is around it and you know some of us will go through I mean nobody gets through life unscathed uh, you know by the time you've got into your 40s or 50s you uh, will have lost and loved and laughed and learned and you know all kinds of things have happened to you but you don't have to have I mean I did I talk about the book standing in the rubble of my life but the difference is now I got to choose which pieces of that rubble I was going to use to rebuild, which pieces I would leave behind and what new bricks I wanted to build and bring into my life. And that is something that, as I say, women in this unique midlife, we haven't been told or taught how to do. So it is I talk about this virgin landscape and it's daunting. Of course, it is. You're having to maybe fight a lot of conditioning in your head that your role in life is to be there for everybody else and that you can't put yourself first and but you have the color marker in your hand to start drawing in some of those signposts for the next half of a part of your life and we get to redefine all aspects careers relationships you know what are the way we look and feel um you know there was a great I was chatting to somebody the other night and he said he was talking to this man who was just about to turn 100 wow. and he said what do you regret in your life? And the man turned around to him and said, I think the thing I regret most is that when I was 70, I didn't realize how young I was. And we have to be really careful about the messages that society is telling us about what we look like, what we should look like, how we age, what's young and old. We get to redefine all of those things for ourselves now. I'm working with women who are going back to college, who are starting new careers, who are giving up careers to do something, a passion project. I'm meeting loads of artists here who are doing art in their 50s and 60s. Um, we get to redefine what our marriage is, maybe after children have left home. We get to redefine a post-marriage relationship. We've just spoken about this privately. You know, um, I'm not looking for a man to father my children or pay my mortgage. So I get to define what our relationship looks and feels like for me right now. And it's exciting. It's exciting. It's very exciting. And 
And I love the way when when I was on your um your when I wrote I think for your your blog and um I love the way you described our first introduction. So I'd love you to share how we met <laughs> with everybody. Thank you for doing that. So I have a Substack uh, called Your Midlife Matters, and um you were very kindly agreed to be interviewed for a series I have on that called Midlife Musings. Um, and yeah, so I was many years ago was writing um, an article uh, for, for a newspaper in Ireland, uh, I think about post-marriage relationships. And I I had been following you and you're a wonderful expert in this area. So I interviewed you and you know the way you can, I can talk to hundreds and thousands of people and then every so often there's just that synergy and connection. Um, and we're laughing here at this retreat because there's a romance going on here between two musicians and you know it's just that they've connected and it's so exciting <laughs> and, and I love that frizzy and I always say you know when you, I some people who have become really good friends I definitely fell in love with them it had that same energy and feeling but anyway we very much connected and the next time I came to London we went for cocktails and um, I loved your energy and I think you know we both come from a very similar place of wanting women to not waste a moment of their lives being held back by conditioning by overwhelm by just the amount of absolute stuff that they have to manage and to live our lives vibrantly so I think that's why we connected because you're one some woman for one woman as we would say here <laughs> hey, I'm Marmite you're either gonna love me or hate me <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those things but thank you and equally the, the 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 feeling was mutual and very much reciprocated and when we did meet for cocktails um I think we laughed so 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 much I missed two or three trains <laughs> before I actually finally got home they're the best, they're the best cocktails <laughs> but as a, let's let's switch to your other life as a as, as a woman and a single mother in this menopausal area of your of your life what do you personally feel for you is your biggest challenge right now so the first thing I I can highlight more on a general level is I think it's so important and it's not happening yet but I think it's something that needs to happen my life imploded at around 45 my marriage ended and my mom died after she'd had a she had a stroke three days after my third baby was born she was at the birth on the Tuesday and um she was looking after my other two children and I was just about to bring Ruby out of hospital and she had a catastrophic stroke so for five years my mom was completely brain damaged and needed 24-hour care so and then she died just after my marriage ended and so there was this sort of feeling of discombobulation obviously and whether that was quite dramatic, but lots of women go through lots of stuff. They're usually very stressed or at the cold face of life as the symptoms of menopause are coming in. And so what I would love to see is just like we have breast check and cervical cancer check and all of these checks, that something somewhere lands on a woman's doorstep at 40 to go, this is what might be happening to you over the next few years. Keep a track because I meet women who are suffering from great anxiety sleeplessness they've lost all sense of themselves and they've put it down to the stress of something else happening in their life but there's also an entire physiological thing going on with them in terms of menopause um so the biggest challenge for me is trying to prioritize right. myself and it is a <laughs> constant yeah. I, I single parent three teenage girls, so it is the horror house of hormones. There is barely a door left on its hinges in my house. Um, um, so I think, yeah, the hardest piece for me is trying to navigate an already busy, difficult, challenging, exciting, dynamic life with me physically and mentally and emotionally changing. Yeah. Um, and trying to keep a track of what is me and what is this process that I'm going through. Um, I'm not scared of it. And I'm very, um, you know, I feel I've, I've given birth to a family and this is my time to give birth to myself. So I'm no, I've no, I've no aging issue with the menopause. As, as, I mean, I'm 53 and I, I, I look forward to another 30 years where I'm not actually held back by periods and pregnancy worries and all of that stuff, you know. Um, but I think the hardest thing for women, whether they're in menopause, perimenopause, postmenopause, is 
And whether they're in their 30s or their 60s, I think the hardest thing for women is staying connected to themselves. I, I, I totally agree. And actually allowing themselves to evolve. That's my favorite word. My favorite word is evolve because I think, especially women, we can become very practical. You know, we we check, we we get, we put that checklist in place. We tick, 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 and you know, your twenties into your thirties, whatever. And life can get really practical very quickly. And what I try, I say, I say to women all the time: trying it out of the or mindset. It's practical or playful. It's it's his way or your way, or you can do this job or that job. And there's so much creativity and ambition and opportunity in the word and. So you can be practical and playful. And I think women become very, very practical and life becomes serious and you become, and I'm not saying you don't go out and have friends, laugh with your friends or stuff, but you take on such an emotional burden of looking after and being responsible for everybody. And so it is hard to stay connected to yourself because Often there's a conditioning that we are not allowed to do that or that, you know, there's just so many bloody demands. But as I say to women, you are going to be a better mother, sister, daughter, partner. Whatever else you want to be, colleague, when you are coming from a place of strength, we've all given from a place of dream and it feels absolutely horrendous when you give from a place of strength. It's a whole different feeling, you know, and I think it's it's a fight you have to fight for to stay connected to yourself. Yeah. And it's OK to evolve. It's OK to change. It's OK to embrace your new body. And if it means you have to go out and buy a new wardrobe, go and enjoy it. It doesn't it doesn't mean that you're not the person that you used to be that defines who you are now. And, and I think this was my biggest challenge is looking back and going, I used to be a size eight. Why am I a mm. size 12 now? What is wrong with me? Why, why can I not get back down to a size eight? I'm going to the gym every day. I'm eating okay, apart from the chocolate, but with that's the chocoholic bit that goes to one side. And, and, and you think, okay, it's just, it's hormones, it's body, it's accepting that we are going to change. So evolution as a body. We don't know when's going to have the body of a 20-year-old. And neither should we have the mind of a 20-year-old. Oh, no, what can't we? <laughs> yeah, because, you know, well, the only regret I have is I didn't appreciate it more when I had it. Oh, no, 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 exactly. <laughs> that's my regret. But, um, no, it, and you're right. And that's that, that the good word about Evolve there is, you know, I think it was... Um, uh what do you call the, the boxer uh butterfly dance like a butterfly um Muhammad Ali and I think it was him who said he talked about a man but he means person the person who um at 50 still looks at life through the eyes of himself as a 30 year old has just wasted 30 years you want to be looking at life through different eyes at 50 than you did at 20 and 30 because you want to accept and evolve so evolution is a wonderful word and where I was going with that little talk about um practical life gets serious and women often think oh I've arrived now I've become an adult and this is who I am and you don't check in again for the 20 30 years sometimes because your life has fallen apart sometimes because you've just had your head barreled down in survival mode and something makes you look up and you might look up and go 20 years have just come past since the last time I looked in the mirror and really saw who I am. So a big part of my work is getting people to go, are the things that you thought were going to make you happy or, and there's nothing wrong with them. There's no mistakes in that sense. What makes you happy now? Who are you now? How are you now? Uh, where are you now at this age and this stage? And now redefine what do you need? So what keeps you sane? What advice do you give to others that you take that's perhaps your your golden piece of advice that keeps you sane? I think there's two things. Am I allowed to say gin? Probably not. Okay, I, I, will, I will not say I'll not say gin. No, <laughs> the thing that keeps me sane is um, kindness to myself. And that was a big lesson to learn. Mm -hmm. And I remember years ago after my marriage had ended and I was just on my knees I had three small kids my mum had just died and and she would have been the one person who would have said to me sit down and have a cup of tea you know look after yourself 
And I remember speaking to a counselor at the time and I just was, and I'm a really strong person. You know, I, I, I will just keep on surviving and, and putting on. And so in this sort of safe, neutral space, I was able to be a little bit, you know, I just want someone to put their hand on my back and tell me it's going to be okay. And she looked at me and she said, the hand is there. It's yours. Now I wanted to slap her because I actually wanted Keanu Reeves to come and put his hand on my back and tell me I was going to be okay. But I, I, she's right. My hand is there. That doesn't mean I can't ask for other hands all of the time. And I'm learning to ask for help and learning to be vulnerable was a huge gift. And I have a great support network around me, which keeps me sane. But knowing that I have the hand on my own back has probably been the most important lesson. Um, and part of having your own hand on your back is knowing when you're overwhelmed and you need to ask for help. So it's not about being over strong. But I think the other piece, if I can, if I can sneak in with two, Go on. Is another one, <laughs> where they are, not where you need them to be. That was huge. Because I think we can spend, whether that's your teenage children, whether that is a partner, whether that is a parent that you've struggled to have proper conversations with, we can spend an awful lot of our energy, again, outputting energy externally, trying to either fix relationships or get people to be a certain way, or um, I, I will be happy when they've apologized. I will be happy when they see my point of view. I will be happy when they're what I want them to be. No, you've got to meet people where they are, not where you need them to be. And then you get to go, all right, now what do I do with that? Exactly, exactly. It's almost a reality check for yourself. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's something like we, we spoke about off camera about this. It's, it's when you fall in love with who someone should be rather than who they are. And when you grieve, we were talking about when, when marriages ended for both of us, it wasn't grieving for the person that we'd lost, but grieving for what we wanted, for what we so desperately needed that wasn't there. And, and I think that is, is, is the same scenario. We can, we can miss something that we haven't got. And it also stops you being, having to be right about everything. And it stops you having to fix everybody. And it stops you having to be responsible for everyone's happiness. And, you know, it's been a game changer for me in terms of raising three teenage girls because of course I want them to see that I need loads of help in the house. Of course I want them to see that they just need to eat three meals a day and stop being so silly and following this silly little girl on Instagram who doesn't eat. Of course I want them, you know, I've got to meet them where they are. Yeah. And then that takes an awful lot of pressure off me because then all I can do is go, I'm here for you. And how would you like my guidance as opposed to, oh, my God, it's my job to fix them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and but but, you know, I say this to women all the time. You're not responsible. First of all, stop making your happiness somebody else's responsibility. It is not your partners. It is not your daughters. It is not your work bosses. But equally, then, when you accept that, you have to accept that you are not responsible for anybody else's happiness. Yes. including your children. Yeah. Now you're responsible for helping them, guiding them, but you've got to allow them to be unhappy and then sit with them. Yeah. And allow them to navigate it rather than fixing mm. it. So, and I know you're a big fixer. We've spoken about this before. And as a parent, you want to put a plaster and it's not only as a parent, you want to do it. I know when my father was dying of cancer, it's, it's such a hard thing when you're watching someone suffer. And you're watching someone in pain, physically, emotionally, psychologically. And when you are a fixer, and we are fixers, and that's why we do the jobs that we do, um, it's hard to actually step back and let them take ownership of it. Let them feel it, think it, and work it out for themselves. And, and your job is to be there. And interestingly, um, so for those not in with the language, I guess, is that, you know, we'll all have some sort of survival mechanism that we took from our childhood and when I say survival I don't mean literal physical but but every child even all three of my children will have their own way of behaving to get what they need most which is attention which is what all people humans require some people become people pleasers some people will become fixers some people will become attention seekers some people will just retreat into the background not to be seen we all have a pattern the key as an adult is to figure out is that pattern serving me and 
do I, I don't need to do that to survive anymore. What is my next? So my was a fixer growing up for lots of reasons. Um, and the joy for me of being a coach is that my job is not to fix. My job is to hold space for someone, guide them and show them their own skills to fix their own life. And that has been such a gift for me. Um, uh, I mean, the fix your little girl will always be in me a little bit. <laughs> and I might you know, I might be silently screaming going <laughs> um can you not see what you need to do <laughs> but that's not my job that's not my job and I, um, and I hear you <laughs> I'm really hard not to do that with my client with my daughters you know there are definitely times when I'm like yeah no that no nope, we're not playing with knives put them down but um, <laughs> but especially when we're all hormonally rampant but um, <laughs> but yeah so so that's another thing is we talked about this off camera as well, that idea of investing in self. It is the most important gift a woman can give. That When I talk about connecting to self, that's what I mean. That we invest so much in the people in our lives. We invest, we are the people at work who are organizing someone's birthday. We're organizing the family. We're looking after everybody else. We're investing so much in the people that we love because we're good, loving, kind women. And we don't invest anything in ourselves. We forget, don't we? We 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 actually put everybody else first, and we and we forget. And you know, I want to, I want to sort of ask you, what do you wish you'd known as a teen growing up that you're if helping your daughters to evolve? I mean, what what things do you think? Wow, if if I'd have known that as a teen, my life would be very different now. Um. I'm going to, I'm, I'm greedy. I'm going to stick two things in as well again. So the first is that use of the word evolve. Um, you don't have to have all the answers by the time you're 20. Your court, your life, by all means, set your direction, but be open and aware to the threads that thread through your life because you will continually be weaving the fabric of your life. You don't have to have it all figured out. Follow your dreams, follow your past and don't be afraid to try something new, to change course, to course correct, to evolve, yeah. to go, that's not serving me anymore. What else do I need to grow personal growth? Um, you know, I I rant all of the time that somewhere, somewhere along the way, especially in the West, decided that in school, the subjects of sort of geography and history were more important than psychology. We teach children and ourselves about biology our bodies but we don't tell teach children about our minds so the second part would be so firstly you are an evolving human being I genuinely hope when I'm 96 I go that's interesting about myself where did that thought come from hmm, that's interesting I'm going to try that um so the first thing is you're evolving you're a river always flowing but the second piece is you're not your thoughts and emotions and if we learned that in school, if we were taught psychology in school alongside biology and history, I think a lot of people would be a lot happier. The way the Buddhists describe it is we are the sky and our thoughts and feelings are the clouds that come and go. But we attach ourselves to the thoughts and feelings. And a lot of the work that I do and you do is getting people to understand that some thought they have in their head or some belief they have about themselves is just a thought. It is it's not necessarily true. Yes. <laughs> as it, it drifts out as quickly as it comes in yeah. you know I I've, I've had thoughts about myself and I just think oh that's, that's not a big fact and then something or I'm like, oh that's not true at all oh my god that was just an I that was just a perception or it so I would tell my girls always be curious be curious about yourself what you're thinking how you're behaving and just question is this the, is this the right thing for me and where did this thought and behavior come from mm, I love that is, is there a better option there's always a better option there's always another option it doesn't necessarily have to be better mm, exactly yeah. it can be different and and I think that's what's so special I just I, th I think curiosity to try different things and feel that life is an adventure rather than a big stress and a big worry and at you know in the teenage years all you're worried about is what your friends think of you how popular you are now with all social media we were really lucky we didn't grow up with social media I'm so grateful that we didn't um we had to sorry I'm going to say a third thing I'm going to be really greedy and take a third uh which which, which um sort of links into that 
It took me a long time to learn this. When I was growing up, I wanted to be Kate Aidy, the BBC war correspondent, you know, and I wanted to travel. I wanted adventure. I loved that. I ended up being very lucky and working for UNICEF and traveling a lot. Um, it took me a long time to understand the difference between adventure and drama. Yes. And I choose adventure and I reject drama now. But it took me a long time to figure that out. So that is another thing I would tell her. And adventure doesn't just mean the big headline stuff. Adventure, coming back to that idea of investment in self, I don't mean go and get surgery and go and spend loads of money on X, Y, Z. I mean, invest time, energy, thought on yourself, curiosity on yourself, the adventure of having a relationship with yourself. So adventure can be big things, but it can also be the adventure of listening to the conditioning that tells you you can't rest and taking a book and going and sitting in the sun and reading anyway. That's an adventure. The adventure of figuring out who you are at this age, at this stage, at every age and stage. Um, and of understanding that drama will drain you and adventure will fill you. Absolutely. It enriches your life. And it's a, I, I completely agree with you. I'm now an adventure seeker. Mm-hmm. Having been drained by the drama for so many years, um, just just like you, I think well, that's one of the things that when you come out of something that's so draining and so exhausting and you you recover, you, rec- you recluse a little bit, you go into your cocoon and you come out as this butterfly. And now now it's about where are we going to fly to? <laughs> We've come out of our cocoon. Where are we going to fly to? And it's where so- are we going to fly to? Or it's okay to rest on this leaf a while and just look at the beauty around me. Absolutely. And just enjoy enjoy the freedom being here yeah absolutely I and- have a oh, sorry no 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 carry on I have a, a journal prompt template that I sometimes give to clients that I use on myself and I've built this up over the years with lots of different things um and you know a very important part of that is setting intention for my day and who I want, you know, how, how do I need to be for myself today? And some days that's, I need to be high energy. I need to be on some days. Oh no, I need to, I'm tired. I'm going to just be, sometimes I I need to keep my higher value today because I might be engaging with someone who's going to be difficult with me, whatever, whatever it might be. But even that simple act of at the beginning of every day and the end of every day, the first and last conversation of every day is with myself. Mm. Mm-hmm. And it's in a kind, a curious, intentional way. And uh, because life is comes at you so fast and it's so easy to wake up every morning and be immediately hijacked by the day, held hostage by everybody else's demands and feelings. You know, I have literally, I can't tell you the texts I've had on this week away from my daughters going, there's a spider in my bedroom. Can you, you know, to, I need this and I need that and I want this and I want that. And, you know, I, it's very easy to let one of my daughter's emergencies become one of my dramas, for example. Yes. So trying to keep that, just keeping intentional and connected to self is just really, really important. And understanding, have trying to have a joyous, curious, humorous relationship with yourself. <laughs> I laugh at myself daily. <laughs> I do, I do. Not often for the right. I, I roll eyes. So not only do I have three teenage daughters rolling their eyes at me, I roll eyes at me. I'm like, oh, here, Alana, come on now. Here's you. <laughs> take the marker hat off. Take it off. Doesn't I, suit you. <laughs> I hear you. Just to wrap this up, I mean, I, you and I can talk all day long. We could talk for a whole week. It, it we, We'd never get bored of talking. Um, but just to wrap it up, you're writing another book, and I'm so excited. When you're, when you're in the midst of this book, I know we will talk again because – this book is taking on a whole new level and a whole new topic and a whole new conversation, which we've spoken about. And, you know, we had to stop ourselves talking about it because I think we could have carried on forever again. But it's, I I want you to just introduce the concept. And if you want people's opinions or research or involvement, I'd love people to know how they can get in touch with you to, to feed you what you need for this book. Thank you so much for that. So my book last year was called Midlife Redefined, Better, Bolder, Brighter. And it's a sort of self-guided book. So I, I take my own story. I uh, I take issues 
from everything from body image to to fashion to how to rebuild and plan properly and then each chapter has an exercise at the end so at the end of the process the reader will have their own bespoke midlife woe manual for want of a better word and it's been great and it's been a wonderful platform to, to to talk with women so I'm following on from that book midlife redefined and this time it's going to be midlife sensuality sex and relationships redefined and the redefined word is very important because it is in this unique midlife for women we get to redefine post-marriage relationships marriages uh our sex life will be re being redefined constantly because of what we're going through in the stages of our life um, and the sensuality part is the, in the sense of being sensual with ourselves, you know, un connecting to our body, be that through yoga, sea swimming to, you know, all kinds of things, sex, if, if that's the part, but it's not the whole part of it. So I am so excited about this book because I think these topics are really, really important. So um, maybe in the, in the notes, you might uh, put, put a link to an article I've just written asking for people's feedback. I've put a few questions in there. I've put some polls in there. I would just love to know what people at different ages are feeling. How are you feeling about sex right now? Is it something that you are suddenly really back engaged with? Is it something you couldn't see far enough? Are you disappointed? Do you want more? Do you want less? In terms of sensuality, how often do you invest in connecting to yourself? Is it something that you even think about? What are the things that really connect you to yourself and make you feel feel like a woman? And I don't necessarily mean sexy. I mean that sense of, oh, I'm really in myself. And then the one about relationships is, do you need to redefine your marriage right now? Do you need to redefine what a post-marriage relationship looks like? What tools would you most want to make something work? And I know this is an area you really deal with as well. So I would love feedback on all of those things. And I can't wait to see the feedback in the book. <laughs> Alana, thank you. And, you know, fizz and tell. I had to start with a glass of fizz, but it is elderflower. <laughs> Well, I've just got water, but I'll fizz you later. And uh, and I love this concept of asking women what's important to them at midlife. You know, it's really important. Well, I can't wait to talk to you again. And thank you for being my very, very first guest. It's my absolute privilege. Thank you. And thank you, everybody. Like, subscribe, join in the conversation. Um, this is This is for you and it's all about you. So we can't wait to connect with you again very soon. Thank you. And you can see I'm new to this because I don't even know where the stop button goes. There we go. Stop recording. Got it. <laughs>